Welcome to this research note catwalk session on transnational organized crime and emerging technologies. My name is Justin Picard. I'm the co-founder and the CTO of a company named ScanTrust. We have developed an internet of things platform that is used to protect products and documents from counterfeiting and illicit trade. We use technologies such as machine learning, blockchain, mobile phone that's uh, authentication devices and digital printing uh, to enable uh, secure traceability and product authentication. I'm also part of an initiative at the European level that aims at developing a, a global infrastructure based on blockchain to allow uh, stakeholders such as customs, uh, right holders, uh, supply chain operators and consumers to interact and inter interface together to address issues of counterfeiting. Um, so uh, digital technology, uh, as we all know, has an increasing role in our life. It also has an increase, increasing role in how it shapes uh, organized crimes and our response uh, to criminals and how we can prevent them to proceed with uh, illicit activities. So technologies such as artificial intelligence or the internet of things or blockchain, supply chain uh, security system, and even uh, like space technologies, they're all tools that, that we can use to prevent or stop organized crime or to mitigate its effect. Uh, if we're able to work uh, together as institutions or as organization, and then we're able to harness these technologies. At the same time, these technologies also provide organized crimes uh, tools for them to proceed with their crime, their illicit activities at, without getting caught. Uh, they, they allow them to more easily distribute their products or, or distribute um, yeah, the proceeds of their activities. So in this session, we have four panelists who will present their views on how emerging technologies can be leveraged by institutions, organizations, or enforcement uh, for citizen security and the prevention and detection of crime in our increasingly digital environment. We also will see how these technologies can be used by organized crime and how we can anticipate that and mitigate these effects. So we have four panelists here. Uh, unfortunately, Guillermo Mendoza uh, was supposed to talk about the use of smart home devices and the security risk the entail uh, cannot be with us. Um, we have uh, Marina, Marina Diaz. Uh, I see you, Marina. Are you, you based in uh, Geneva, I believe? Yeah. Yes, um, I'm currently in Geneva. Hi, Marina. Okay. So you are a program assistant at uh, UNICRI, United Nations Inter Interregional Crime and Just Justice Research Institute. And you're with the Knowledge Center for Security through Research, Technology and Innovation. So your presentation is entitled Infiltration of Organized Crime into the Legal Economy, uh, Supply Chain Security. And uh, you will talk about threats in the supply chain and technology solutions such as blockchain and biometrics big data, analytics, and AI. Um, after you, there will be uh, Jaime Trinidad. Hi, Jaime. Um, hello. Hello. I believe you're based in Mexico City at the moment? Yes, at the moment, in Mexico. Okay, great. Um, so uh, you're co-founder and CEO of uh, an organization named LT3D Lab. It's a 3D printing laboratory, which prints parts for medical equipment that are used for COVID. Um, you, um, you have also made uh, a, a master at uh, Polytechnic Paris on the Internet of Things. Um, and you will talk about the future of IoT, the fusion of, the fusion of IoT and artificial intelligence, and the challenges that we have to keep the IoT secure. Um, and you will give examples of how organized crime can use this, this technology to their advantage. After Jamie, we'll, we'll have Frederick Florence, uh, who is a PhD candidate in Oxford. Uh, I don't know if you have your camera on, uh, Frederick. Yeah, hello. Oh, hello, okay. <laughs> I don't see you, but uh, 
because there's a 150 participants here. Uh, yeah, so uh, before, before being a PhD candidate in international relations at the University of Oxford, you completed a master in global crime, justice and security at the University of Edinburgh. And your thesis was on how technology can become appropriated by organized crime group. And in your talk entitled Outer Space Outlaws, you will talk about the risk of organized crime in, in space. And you will present a framework that can be used by institutions to make sense of how organized crime might be able to use these technologies and how we might be able to mitigate that. Finally, we'll have uh, Mauricio Bastia, who is a lead for Castro at the Center for Security and Emerging Technologies in Georgetown University. Uh, hello, Mauricio. Hello, how are you? Good morning. I'm good, how are you? Yeah. So you're based in, so Georgetown, are you based in Washington, near Washington? Uh, right now I'm in Mexico City. Oh, Mexico as well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so you work with the government of Mexico, the International Development Bank and the European Union, and you also serve as delegate to the UN. Your presentation is entitled Goth Tech and Security, uh, Challenges for Innovation. And it will be about digital transformations that police institutions need to implement in order to face new threats related to emerging technologies and their need for institutional capacity, human capital and sustainable action frameworks. Just before we start, just let me give the, the ground rules for the session. So while the first, first of all, the aim and objective is to really foster as much discussion as possible on the interplay between organized crime and technology. So after uh, the speakers give their presentation, I hope there will be a lot of interaction and brainstorming uh, uh, with all participants. Each presentation should take five to seven minutes. And uh, after, so after the last speaker, we will open the floor to the online, online audience for short comments and questions. Um, there should be about 25 to 30 minutes for that. Uh, during the, during the, um, the uh, presentation, I encourage you to already type in your question in the chat. It will be all collected. Uh, and then when we start the, uh, the, 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 the question session, then we'll start with those questions right away. And then afterwards, you will be able to either still type in your question uh, or, or if you raise your hand, uh, you will be able to, to uh, ask your question orally, uh, or you can also make a, a brief comment. So let's get started right now with Marina Diaz and her presentation on the infiltration of organized crime into the legal economy, supply chain security. The floor is yours, Marina. Thank you, Justin. Um, it's not allowing me to share the presentation now. Okay, here it is. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to share with you some of the work we, we do at Unicre, specifically at the Serio Knowledge Center. Uh, first of all, just a brief comment of what we do there is that we analyze the impact of the uh, rapid technology changes. We try to identify security threats, but also possible solutions uh, to develop uh, strategies for this stress. These are some of the topics uh, we analyze in the Knowledge Center. Um, I'm going to present a very brief uh, case where you can see how technology can be used to uh, combat uh, the, the infiltration of organized crime in the supply chain. Uh, in the supply chain. So uh, first of all, uh, where does the money come from? The money for, uh, of criminal organization come from different sources including drug trafficking, people trafficking, environmental crimes, counterfeiting, among others. Uh, but why would they uh, infiltrate the legal economy if they already have a source of income? So uh, basically we identified some, some of these trends. Uh, so they, they infiltrate the, the legal economy to uh, do money laundry, 
to uh, seek for more profit, to seek for a social approval and a larger control of territory, but also to diversify their, their investments. Uh, so organized crime can infiltrate the supply chain in different ways. These are just some of the ways they can do it. Uh, they can directly enter the supply chain or a part of the supply chain. Uh, they can acquire a chain in the case, for example, of food, they can acquire supermarket chains, they can acquire um, stores, uh, they can create local monopolies, uh, imposing products that come from organized crime. So what are the consequences of this infiltration? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we, if, if the criminal organizations uh, infiltrate legal economy, they have more profits from here, which means that they, there's a growth in the organized crime illicit activities because the money uh, goes directly to those activities as well. But also we have interesting uh, consequences such as the health threats for the population. Uh, for example, if the organized crime uh, infiltrates the food supply chain, uh, then we have that maybe they substitute products for low quality ones, or uh, they can even intentionally spread um, poison or they can spread uh, agents into the supply chain. So that would be, and that would directly impact the population. Uh, but also they control the territory since they, they uh, they spread the, the control of the physical uh, chains and stores uh, that are part of the supply chain. So they, at the same time, control more territory. Um, and then, of course, they get higher profits and investment. So some of the threats in the supply chain that we identify, these are not uh, all encompassing, but there are some of the threats, uh, of some of the threats we, we identify. It's, uh, the repacking operations where they substitute the original product with counterfeit, uh, which can be quite dangerous if we're talking about food, if we're talking about pesticides, for example, it can be quite dangerous for the population. But obviously there are also some other threats we can see like the lack of control over the product uh, quality once it's packed uh, and the creation of clandestine uh, set shops and production centers. Uh, which means that if at some point in the supply chain, the criminal organization controls a part of it uh, and the rest, it's, let's say it's uh, legal and it's a normal supply chain, you might not realize that they are uh, exchanging product or that they are using, uh, for example, uh, they are including human trafficking in this chain or that they are exchanging the product. So that's one of the biggest risks. Uh, but also, like, uh, we don't have a way to monitor the full data exchange in the supply chain or to control over the distribution of the product. And finally, the consumer is unaware of what is going on uh, during the supply chain process. Uh, then in the supply chain, we have another, another uh, thing that uh, we can analyze, which is e-commerce. What happens in e-commerce? Uh, sometimes people are buying counterfeit products and they're not aware of this. So we need a more of, we need a, a larger um, cooperation between all services, all authorities, but also deep monitoring of the e-commerce platforms and in general, uh, all the platforms where you can acquire products. So um, I'm going to explain a bit how technology can be used to tackle these threats. So the first solution, it's a multi-layer security uh, solution. And it's a, it's, a, it's a solution that also uses blockchain to protect uh, the whole process. So first of all, uh, here it's a bit more clear. Uh, first of all, you identify the product. I, the authentication process can include many things from QR codes, labeled tags, uh, anything that uh, could help you identify your product from the rest. Uh, it, can be, it can be easily identified or hidden. Uh, we have both examples here, a QR code. It's easily identified by, by the customer or a hidden one where you need um, a special device to actually see the, the authentication code. Um, it can either be made for stakeholders in the supply chain or for customers. It can be customized, it can be integrated with other solutions as well. 
And then the second step is uh, traceability. Uh, in here, you link the physical product with the digital traceability system. Uh, it can be done through the authentication method. It can be uh, done through radio frequency identification systems. Uh, and it's all secure in a digital database. And it's, it's really important to understand that all of this is secure by blockchain technology. So it means that uh, every exchange in data is protected and it cannot be removed, modified. Uh, it's pretty much transparent for every stakeholder in the supply chain. And finally, we have data analytics that will help us um, uh, really see in a simplified way the, the process uh, of the supply chain. All of this protected by blockchain. Um, the second way we can use technology in the supply chain, and these are just examples, of course, we have a lot of ways, but this is some of the examples, is using big data analytics. Um, this will help us uh, acquire a, a long and very diverse, diverse uh, data and you can use all the data you need from, uh, from search engine, from social media, marketplaces, everywhere where you can sell products. So you can obtain all this data and then it can be processed through machine learning, for example, uh, where, you can, where you can associate uh, the data and the elements you want to analyze. And then you can identify the connection between websites, for example, and users. Uh, and then you have uh, integral insights of the issues and it's easier to identify the counterfeit products. And the final step would be uh, the cloud-based platforms where you can actually display the data and it's easy for the stakeholders to, to keep an eye on, on all the process. So uh, this is just one way in which it can be done. These solutions already exist. Uh, for example, uh, this will help you to look for counterfeit products of your brand that are being sold online, but it can also be used, for example, to uh, analyze which reviews in a marketplace are fake, because sometimes uh, criminals uh, use fake reviews uh, to try to create this, uh, co uh, this confidence from the client so they can sell the products easier. So with this technology, you could see which uh, reviews are fake, for example. So it can help us analyze and actually take the counterfeit products out of the market. Um, this is all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina. Very interesting presentation. Yeah, lots of potential in these uh, technologies. Um, okay. so. Uh, let's move to our uh, next speaker, uh, Jamie Trinidad, for a, co um, uh, a talk entitled Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence and uh, Security. Actually, a bit longer, sorry. I will let you give your title, uh, Jaime. Hello. Oh, so I'm going to speak about uh, Internet of Things, a little vision of the future and the security. Why do we need to develop uh, secure devices uh, and edge devices and some example uh, of it? So uh, in general, the parad paradigm in IoT is that all kind of devices that sense, they are uh, communicating, sending all kinds of information uh, to the network, to the cloud, and, and they speak each other. So uh, it's difficult to know where our information is uh, because there are a lot of companies or enterprise that are uh, selling all kinds of uh, network devices. Uh, and maybe uh, you don't know where all that information is going. And because they speak each other, maybe they take the information of other device and send it to, to other place that we don't want. So it's really important to take care about this. Uh, and this technology is growing really, really fast. Uh, by 2023, they are thinking that there will be more than 100 billion devices connected to the network. 
So this will increase. Uh, we are going to have uh, all kind of data in the in the cloud in, in servers, and uh, we don't know in, in what servers. No, that's why we it's necessary to develop uh, secure devices. Now uh, the future of I of IoT uh, is going to be with the artificial intelligence, the five G network that now is ready for all these kind of devices for speak each other. Now, for example, 4G network is not ready for that. So devices uh, run in 2G or maybe 1G uh, uh, network. And all the of big data, because uh, with all these are going to have the algorithms for artificial intelligence. So now I'm going to speak uh, about the uh, HIOT, uh, that it's, uh, what is it? What is it? is the artificial intelligence that are the algorithms which enable a uh, simulated activity of the human brain, plus the edge computing. What is edge computing? Uh, it's like an intermediary between uh, cloud data centers and devices. Uh, now edge computing uh, function as a filter. They don't say, we don't send all information to data centers because there's information that it's not necessary so it's around here in the edge and only sends the information to the cloud center. Now, uh, downloading the layer of artificial intelligence, uh, devices are going to connect to the edge and with the algorithm trained, are going to respond uh, to, uh, to make actions uh, in real time to these devices. Why is important HIoT? Because it's going to be uh, a part of key task that need that needs no latency in in our devices, like in hospitals, autonomous cars, factories, smart cities. Uh, they are not going to connect to the cloud. They are going to connect to the edge, and we are going to have a real time response. No, some key cores of HIE IoT is that uh, we are going to have security and privacy, low connectivity, low latency. Uh, and it's going to work as hybrid computing. Edge IoT uh, won't disappear all the data centers. It will work, work together, but uh, to, it will really be secure and, and we have all that privacy that we want. That's why it's necessary to develop uh, in our world, in companies, uh, secure devices and secure edge devices. So uh, there's uh, our challenge to develop all these kind of devices because in some devices there are insufficient tests and compilers and they take out to the market. Uh, there's lack of awareness. Uh, maybe some company uh, see that we have issues with that devices and they don't update uh, and they, uh, they let them be like that and they can be hacked, uh, they can be espionage. Uh, there's no robust design in some devices. Uh, we can have botnet attacks, uh, all the kind of weak, weak passwords that all people use it uh, in the world. Uh, there are a lot of weak uh, passwords. And with all this, we are going to have uh, our data integrity maybe out. Uh, the reason to develop in the world uh, secure devices and secure edge devices for the critical task is uh, I'm going to speak about some uh, scenarios that experts develop uh, that the crime and terror acts uh, are using uh, with the IoT. Uh, maybe they can hack your smart home, your smart home devices and because all devices are talking each other, they can enter to maybe all devices if they enter in one of your homes and take your uh, information and blackmail you. Uh, also, smart cities under attack, they can combine cyber attacks in the city with physical attacks. They may know uh, if they hack the city, uh, traffic lights or other stuff, uh, police communication that they are connected to a network. Uh, they can uh, combine it and they can set we are going to attack here or make all that stuff. Uh, in hospitals, uh, there are critical tasks that now are uh, connected to devices and if they hack them, they can uh, uh, hurt people. 
no so um, or maybe all the hospitals uh, or take down all machines uh, etc the defense systems uh, also if they had the, the, the defense systems uh, they can collect their data they can know where are all these people and uh, with uh, for example resource data they can also uh, steal that resource data understand where can they attack or understand how to to steal all the resources like all like uh, uh, all that kind of stuff so that's why it's necessary uh, to develop in the world uh, to attach that uh, that uh, security for all the systems so thank you uh, very much Thank you very much, Jaime. It's a really fascinating but very scary topic because uh, with IoT, um, it seems that when an attack is made, it can really be launched at, at a large scale. Uh, and that whatever we do, there will always be security flaws in, all the, in these systems and just waiting for someone to find them and take advantage of it. Yes. But, yeah. So, um, yeah, for our next talk, um, we have uh, Frederick Florence, uh, who will talk about now security threats in space. Um, his talk is entitled Outer Space Outlaws, the risk of organized crime in space. Uh, you can start, uh, Frederick. Uh, thank you. I hope you can see my screen. Um, can you see my screen? We can see. Perfect. All right. So my talk is called Outer Space Outlaws, and I'm going to talk about the risks of organized crime in space. So the question that I'm asking is, could organized crime groups get a hold of space technologies? Now, at first, this might sound like the premise of a new science fiction novel or a new James Bond movie. But if we think more deeply about this, there might be actually good reasons why this could happen. So the first one is that the privatization of the new space industry or of the space industry as a whole reduces the cost of space technologies dramatically. So to give you a reference point, the space shuttle program costs around 61,000 US dollars to send something into space uh, per one kilogram. Um, currently the Falcon 9 Heavy by SpaceX costs around 1,500 US dollars to send one kilogram into space. And next year there is supposed to be a new um, SpaceX spacecraft called Starship, which is supposed to cost only 10 US dollars. So just 10 US dollars per kilogram, which is quite a dramatic reduction. And secondly, we shouldn't underestimate the ingenuity of organized crime groups in obtaining technologies. Um, this might sound a bit redundant, but um, in, in 2019, we have uh, the Spanish Coast Guard, for example, found a submarine carrying around three tons of cocaine in front of the Galician coast. So that shows you that organized crime groups are pretty uh, capable and um, resourceful in obtaining technologies. And the last thing is that space technology give you certain strategic advantages. A case in point is the uh, US military who has currently still the cutting edge in technology and is therefore um, incredibly, um, incredibly uh, capable. So what are these capabilities? So there are, there are three. They basically are exactly what they, what they say. There's Earth observations, uh, geospatial positioning, and satellite communication. So in theory, Earth observation would allow um, organized crime groups to check for police uh, checkpoints in real time, law enforcement movements, and circumvent them accordingly. Geospatial positioning allows you to track careers and agents and operatives and find alternative routes. And satellite communication allows um, organized crime groups to direct agents in remote areas where cell phone networks break down in a secure manner. So in essence, what we can say about all these three technologies that they have in common is that they centrally aggregate information about the planet and then facilitate the distribution thereof. And that makes them particularly suitable for logistical, complex logistical or tactical operations with transnational dimensions. So now, because this is a very speculative talk, I want to ground this a little bit more into theory. And I think it's not enough to just say, oh, these are the advantages, so organized crime groups will do this. No, I think we need to kind of look at the institutions of organized crime and likewise at the social structures that, um, that can be facilitated by technologies. So there is a theory called adaptive structuration theory. In essence, it says groups and technologies both harbor social structures. 
Um, and then groups will appropriate those technologies that mirror their social structures the best. And once appropriated into a group, uh, technologies and groups reshape each other. So then the question becomes, how can we classify social structures? And here I use another theory, which was developed by some of the people mentioned down here, who will hopefully excuse me reducing this theory into a few seconds. But essentially, this is cultural theory. And it says that all social relations can be plotted across two dimensions, grid and group over here. So grid is the extent to which the actions of an individual in a collective are left to their own. And group is the extent to which um, you feel uh, an individual member of a social collective feels associated to the broader collective. So this yields four quadrants um, of, social, of social organizations. And I'm only concerned in this talk with the high grid dimensions. So hierarchical or fatalist. And according to the framework, we now might ask, OK, we can plot somewhere space technology. We can position it somewhere in this diagram. And I would say it's probably somewhere here in the high grid because it's, um, it, it, it centrally aggregates um, information and facilitates command structures. So then the question becomes, OK, who might want these high grid structures to facilitate their operations? And there we have terrorist organizations. I know we can talk about whether they are actually hierarchical or more factionalized. There's a lot of debate and transnational trafficking groups. Um, this could also include insurgent groups, which I haven't listed, but um, they, they could be also included here. So now after this sort of speculative frenzy, I want to put this more into a, into a realistic context um, and sober up a little. So um, there is international space law, which restrains the abilities of private actors into states because it, it says that states are responsible for any activity in, in outer space. So that means that states keep a tight grip over space activities, even if they are private activities. Then secondly, getting into space is hard. It's very hard. I know I said that we shouldn't underestimate the ingenuity of organized crime groups, but ac uh, acquiring space technology requires um, a vast amount of experts um, that is very difficult to do clandestinely. And the, sec the last thing is getting into space is also loud. Um, states will monitor the, the unauthorized launches and are likely to detect them um, and intervene or interject any unauthorized launches. So to give you a brief conclusion, we can think of um, those organized crime groups that are most likely to appropriate tech, uh, space technologies are those that require a high grid structure or those that want a high grid structure. So in, in that sense, those involved in complex operations that require a lot of direction and coordination or would benefit from this. Um, the second thing is that organized crime groups require deep cooperation with states outside of the space law regime if they want to appropriate space technology. And then once appropriated, the OCG state relations as well as the OCG technology relations are likely to deepen and change. So there is a possible outlook from where we can go from here. I group them in theoretical and practical. Theoretically, we can think of indicators that measure this relationship between states, but also the four relation, social relationships that I outlined. And then we can also debate whether space technology is fatalist or hierarchical. Um, then the other thing is more practical um, that relates to the problem of dual use systems. Um, that is systems that are used both by military or civilian um, uh, agents. And then we can also think of the prospects of insurance fraud or embezzlement in the new space industry. Oh, well, um, yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick. Very insightful um, uh, talk. You know, it's, it's, it's rare that uh, we have the opportunity to, to preparing for a potentially upcoming type of crime before it occurs. Usually we're more reactive. Um, I hope that uh, all the, these insights and the analysis that uh, you and imagine your maybe your research department are, are doing will be will be leveraged so that we don't get caught off guard in the, in the future. So, um, so our last uh, presentation is going to be by uh, Mauricio Bastian and it's entitled uh, GovTech and security uh, challenges for innovation. Uh, Mauricio, the, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to everyone who has made uh, this conference uh, possible, to all the volunteers and the secretariat team, because uh, without them, this uh, wouldn't be possible. So um, my, my presentation will um, address the uh, main concerns and the, and the main tasks that uh, police institutions and, and governments uh, need to implement in, in order to have a, a strengthened uh, technological uh, framework to address all the challenges that uh, we just have uh, been uh, presented uh, about uh, Internet of Things, uh, uh, outer space technology and uh, supply chain uh, technology. So um, I, I will uh, do, uh, I, I will first present uh, four main pillars and then give uh, some examples uh, to, to finally end with the uh, conclusions. So, um, well, um, here first the, the uh, four main uh, key areas that um, I believe are, are important to, to address and to have in mind are the following. First, uh, technology uh, transfers uh, through strategic partnerships with a, a, a view of uh, exchange of uh, information. And of course, all that within a strong uh, legal and policy framework. So uh, what do I mean with our first uh, pillar, uh, technology transfer? Well, uh, Whenever we talk about uh, technology, we uh, tend to, to we tend to, to uh, mix it with uh, innovation, and um, there is uh, this bad uh, idea or this uh, misunderstood concept that uh, um, all technology is innovation, but uh, it's not. Right? Uh, not all innovation is uh, technological, and not all uh, technology means innovation. So therefore, when we talk about technology transfer, we need to have a comprehensive approach where we talk about human capital, institutional capacity, and uh, evidence-based technology with a sustainable uh, approach as well. It's not just uh, technology uh, per se. Then um, about the exchange of uh, inform information, we need that uh, governments and uh, uh, state and, and local uh, authorities uh, will uh, have their information in an uh, interoperativity, inter, uh, uh, bidirectional uh, information where uh, uh, both ends have this uh, uh, correct information. And of course, um, we need uh, privacy uh, concerns to, because uh, all of this information is uh, related to, to our users. So, so we need to uh, offer them uh, privacy. And uh, of course, there are the three uh, Vs of uh, big data that uh, will have a volume and we need this information and this data to be verifiable. And we need to have add, added value of uh, with this uh, big data that uh, we, we are uh, getting. In, uh, meanwhile, we implement uh, all this uh, technology, as Mariana was uh, saying, when we do all this, uh, for example, uh, supply, uh, supply chain uh, technological implementations in, in, for security. Then uh, also, I, I identify uh, strategic partnerships um, to implement uh, technological innovations, and, uh, and we need to get on board a private sector. Uh, companies uh, that work on, uh, on technology, academia as well, civil society, with an approach of uh, shared responsibility because uh, when we talk about uh, security, we uh, most of the times we say, oh, that's a responsibility of the government, but we need to, to bring all the uh, responsible actors uh, on board. And also these strategic partnerships ne needs a uh, strength uh, governance and um, of course aligned with the um, sustainable uh, development goals. And um, then as, as I was telling, we need a legal framework because uh, uh, criminal uh, innovations as, as, as we just uh, saw, as, as Jaime and Frederick uh, were telling, well, they, they are 
uh, getting more uh, innovative as sometimes uh, governments. So we need to address those, those challenges uh, with an ethic uh, perspective, uh, because uh, well, we, we have to bear in mind that uh, not all the legal decisions uh, have a, a, a justice uh, approach. No? So, so we need to bear in mind those. And also a national and, and, and international level legal framework. And also here I will include uh, local uh, level as well. Uh, I saw that on the chat some questions and uh, Tatiana, I think from the European Forum of Security, I was talking about the, the implications for local governments and, and national governments. Well, here, here there are, they, they need to join their, their legal framework. And some examples here, for example, um, here you can see the 911 uh, uh, operations center from uh, Honduras and uh, 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 a low income uh, country in uh, Central America that uh, has implemented uh, uh, technology no? and, and, and with, with this uh, they, they have uh, they, they face different challenges. For example, when they were trying to implement face recognition cameras or uh, high end technology cameras, well, they the, the first innovation that they had to make or the first change was an infrastructure change because they didn't have the uh, bandwidth to in, in order to use those uh, kind of cameras so uh, that's when i uh, that's an example of first doing other kinds of uh, uh, innovations in order to use uh, real uh, technology and, and to implement real technological changes also when i talk about exchange of information uh, well, there is a need that all countries have the same uh, standards for uh, uh, classification of crimes, for example, because uh, a smuggling of uh, and, or trafficking in persons can be uh, defined as uh, one thing in one country, but as another in other countries. So uh, they need to be all the, all the same uh, standards so in order to uh, face those those uh, crimes in the same way in a, in a not only in a national level but also in a regional and international uh, level so the UNODC uh, effort is a good example of uh, of this and um also when um about uh, strategic partnerships well uh, here is an example of uh, a good uh, uh, partnership uh, where uh, different agencies of different governments um uh, came together to uh, combat um, uh, gangs uh, across uh, the Central America and uh, Mexico. So uh, the, the, this is the, the kind of examples that uh, I, I mentioned. And uh, the last one is uh, about the legal framework. Uh, right now we are facing, uh, this is a, a, a gun, a 3D printed uh, gun, so uh, there is, uh, in most of our countries, there is no legal framework uh, in order to address uh, this, this crime because uh, the only uh, uh, definition of a gun is, uh, of a firearm is a, is a regular uh, firearm that we all know, but uh, there are no laws about this. And uh, also the, the UN has uh, started the conversation about this topic, new technologies, uh, to manufacture uh, illicit firearms. So, so we need to bear in mind. And well, uh, the main three points for uh, conclusion is that uh, we need uh, transparency. It's important about uh, all this uh, data that we are uh, generating and, and, and we are processing. We need also coordination am among uh, in a vertical and horizontal level. Uh, vertical, uh, I mean, from uh, all the uh, national, subnational, and international uh, governments and actors, and uh, uh, and horizontal. I mean, from different uh, ministries that are involved in in security, from the security ministry, from the general attorney office, uh, from the judiciary branch, and also uh, we need uh, an approach with technology and innovation. The one that I, the ones that I I mentioned that uh, we need to bear in mind that. All, uh, that not all technology means innovation. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mauricio. It's a very uh, solid and uh, concrete uh, presentation on how we need to uh, 
what we need to do uh, or what uh, police institutions need to do to leverage these uh, new technology in a, technologies in an effective way. So um, I think now we, we have, uh, yeah, or, or in time we have 30 minutes uh, for, for questions. Um, so I already have a few questions that were asked in the chat. Uh, so we'll go through those and then we'll see afterwards if there are people want to take the floor to ask their question or if there's more questions in the chat. So the um, uh, first question is a general question uh, uh, for, for the speakers. Uh, how, so it's from Tatiana Morales. Question is, how can emerging technologies support the local security stakeholders to combat organized crimes consequences at the local level? So really the focus of using technology to address issues at the local level. So um, anyone who would, would like to take the lead on answering this question? Mariana, you, you, you want to go? Oh, sure. Uh, I, well, I think, I think Mauricio talked about a bit of this in his presentation, but uh, in general, I would say technology is highly adaptable. Uh, so, uh, for example, the examples I, I decided to talk about today, there are just a few examples of how you can use this technology, but you can use, for example, big data to analyze instead of uh, fake reviews online, you can use it to analyze illicit uh, uh, trade in online trade uh, and then identify the actors and how they are connected. And this can be used by authorities to to actually identify criminals. Uh, the same thing with artificial intelligence. Uh, you can combine all these tools uh, to, to, um, to have different uh, objectives. Uh, another example would be used uh, to avoid uh, uh, the dual use of dangerous um, materials. For example, if you, uh, use this technology in the supply chain, but in the supply chain of a nuclear plant, for example. So I think um, Mauricio talked a bit about the, the adaptability in, in governments, but I think uh, these, these technologies can, can really be used uh, by authorities to actually um, help uh, in the identification of criminal organizations and their activities. Uh, it depends on, on, on which activities, but it's, it's technology, uh, at least in my opinion, does not replace humans. It helps them. It gives them more tools to analyze, to have concrete data. So uh, you can adapt this technology for them, for sure. Uh, I don't know if you, anyone wants to add something. Mauricio, I know it was a bit uh, part of your topic, but do you, do you want to add a few words? Yes, well, um, thank you for, for the question, uh, Tatiana Morales. Um, yes, well, de definitely uh, local uh, governments, uh, well, as I was uh, talking, uh, they, they need to strengthen their, their legal framework, their institutional capacity before uh, doing that jump to implementing uh, new technologies so, so, and, and, and combat uh, organized crime. You know? So first they need the, the whole uh, uh, framework uh, in order. So, so, and of course, uh, this will uh, trigger that, you know? the new technologies can trigger a strengthened uh, uh, institutional capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so moving to um, the next question from Shuk Wemeka Ngene, hope I pronounced the name uh, correctly. So the question is, uh, is quite open-ended. It, it is, what is the link between artificial intelligence and intellectual property? I think we can say in, in the context of organized crime, but I think um, um, any of the speakers can take it uh, from, uh, there's multiple angles from which this question can be taken. So if one of you want to take the lead, go ahead. No one. Um, 
I thought maybe that uh, uh, Jaime, I, I thought maybe that um, a, it would be interesting yeah, to, to think about, uh, you know, in the context of IoT and artificial intelligence, uh, how do you get, how can you even protect intellectual property? You know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe well, uh, I think, uh, yeah, to protect uh, intellectual property, uh, for me, uh, for the artificial intelligence or for IoT devices is uh, to develop uh, uh, more secure devices to to get strong with all the legal or part from governments uh, in which uh, models or which devices are are accepted or which one no no there's a lot of liberty in a lot of countries. Uh, without uh, the specific laws or regulations, let's say regulations. Uh, so they can develop a lot of, of these kind of products uh, in the countries. There are others like in, I think in Europe, they are more uh, strict with this, with this kind of part, but it's also slow, no? Uh, enterprises, factories, or maybe in the organized crime take uh, uh, take all this technology, uh, take advantage, and governments uh, maybe see it six months later, one year later, or or get the regulations later, and maybe uh, that's the part uh, that we need to, to get better. So it's difficult because technology is really fast uh, in all kinds of ways, for positive ways or for negative ways. Uh, so I think uh, the part is that we need the regulations uh, also get really fast, but I think it's very difficult in the in the speed time uh, develop of technologies. I will just briefly add that in, in my field, uh, artificial intelligence is used to uh, to detect counterfeits to find uh, illicit trade patterns. Uh, based on the analysis of, of big data that comes from scans by consumers and supply chain on the field. Um, okay, so let me move to the, the next questions. Actually, there's two questions that relate to space uh, technology. Get ready, Frederick. So I'll just give you the two questions simultaneously. You can answer, can give a, a full answer to those. So first question from Rico A is uh, do organized crimes uh, groups really need their own space capabilities or isn't it enough to kind of hijack commercially available space, space technology and modify them for their own purposes, uh, as you mentioned? Um, and then there's another question from, from uh, Francis Cleland Bones, uh, which is, uh, do you have a view of how space technology could be used to counter transnational organized crime? Is this already happening? It seems that much of the scope for criminal activity could also be used as an approach against such crime. Um, yeah, yeah, those are, thank you uh, for the two really good questions. Um, regarding Rico's question, yes, um, that, that might be possible. Um, so I, I was more interested in, in, instead of viewing governments or uh, commercial actors as a binary, maybe as um, cooperatives, but um, it could it is entirely possible that organized crime groups could um, hijack uh, space capabilities in in various ways. It should be noted, though, that that is again a very difficult thing to do. Um, space is a highly delicate dimension; uh, it's a highly delicate area, um, and it's closely monitored. So um, usually uh, NASA or space agencies keep, keep their uh, assets very securely safe from outside infringement. What could be possible instead of hijacking them could be destroying them. The technology is not quite there yet, but that could be also a um, possibility that eventually uh, organized crime groups might find ways of um, destroying satellites from, from the planetary surface. Um, and then regarding Francis's question, this is kind of leading there because I guess organized crime groups would destroy um, satellites that are being used by law enforcement. 
Um, and this is already happening. And this has been actually happening for a long time. Um, so I'm aware of uh, tracking people that have, um, tracking them using satellites or as well Earth observation. I think a lot of, um, a lot of trafficking groups, especially in areas that are difficult to reach uh, for, for local uh, enforcement because of the territorial uh, conditions um, there in order to figure out where people are, um, uh, Earth observation comes in, in, in a, um, comes in very well. Uh, navigation systems are also some um, really good ones. Um, it kind of leads to also a merging of military and policing because often these technologies are in the hands and in the control of the military. So um, sometimes there is this blurring of a boundary between what is military and what is police. And um, these technologies um, are a great example for this um, because there's this cooperation between law enforcement and military, or sometimes the military will, because they have the access to these, um, to these technologies, will take over um, policing uh, tasks. So yes, this is happening. Uh, it could be entirely possible for, um, and it, it, it is happening for um, law enforcement and governments to use it to combat transnational organized crime. And probably there are way more uh, good things about to happen and coming out of this industry. Thank you very much, Frederick. Um, just another uh, question focused on the threat of uh, technology. Uh, it is, this is from uh, Diego Flaitas. Uh, and the question is, how do you evaluate the 5G risk and if it is possible to mitigate them. Uh, I would suggest maybe that Jaime uh, yes. starts an answer and then if others, uh, other speaker you want to add something, feel free. Okay, so uh, first 5G. Uh, 5G, it's a massive machine type communication. So what's going to happen is that we, will, uh, we can connect there a lot, lot, lot of devices and uh, this means that we can't. We are going to connect uh, low-cost IoT devices, uh, low-power devices uh, with low latency. So, uh, how to mitigate? What What's the issue here? Uh, maybe it's no 5G. No, because 5G it's on only the the transport. Maybe are going to be all the devices, the devices that are going to connect here. So to mitigate all 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 these kind of issues from devices, uh, speaking about IoT, is uh, that uh, for devices, we take care about uh, their security inside. We can uh, maybe in regulations, uh, we can let uh, all kind of device, devices maybe uh, go out to the market because a lot of devices have a lot of, of weak points that they might be hacked because uh, for a lot of companies, it's easy to, to, to sell more components than taking care about uh, their security. So at this point, uh, I think uh, the, best, the best for 5G components devices, speaking about IoT, is the security of, the, of, of these devices, of how they are constructed, of how, how strong are in this part. So for 5G, uh, I think this is the, the best because it's only the transport, the communication, no? the, the 5G fast, but they will let a lot of massive uh, devices to connect to, to this network. Thank you, Jaime. Does anyone want to add something? Or if not, uh, let's move to the next question, um, which is, uh, do you know, it's from uh, Jennifer, uh, to, uh, so any, uh, to all the panelists, do you know any instances in which technology has gone wrong in detecting organized crime in supply chain? Sometimes it may be easier to talk about success stories of blockchain or AI. Uh, and so in those cases, uh, what are the lessons learned uh, and potential improvement? So does any of you have some uh, interesting story to share here? Uh, 
I well, I I don't have in mind a concrete example right now, but um, as I said before, I don't think uh, technology is perfect. These are tools that are helping people uh, with processes, uh, with specific goals. I don't think technology, we haven't got to that point where everything is just perfect. For example, okay, blockchain can help us see if the volume of product during the supply chain changes, and then we can in fear that something is going wrong there. Uh, but at the end, I don't think, um, I don't think it's uh, it can help us with all the issues that we have right now in the specific case of supply chain. Uh, for example, what do you do when uh, organized crime controls the whole supply chain? So they don't infiltrate it, but they control everything from the distribution manufacturer uh, to the supermarkets. Uh, then in this case, I can say, okay, technology cannot really help us, uh, at least not uh, what we know now or what we analyze. So there are certainly certainly issues still that uh, technology cannot solve. Um, uh, at the end, uh, they are a tool for us to, to identify issues. Thank you, Marina. Anyone wants to add something? Um, I will just add uh, from my own experience here is, uh, uh, well, in the anti-counterfeiting space, uh, actually one issue is that Indeed, uh, companies, brand owners are sometimes scared to implement technology uh, and like let, for example, all consumers scan to authenticate because they fear, you know, what is going on, what is going to happen, like if something wrong happens, like, for example, if the system wrongly says, oh, it's a counterfeit, but it was an original product, or even it, it was a fake product, but, um, but, but then, um, um, and this, they, they start to publicize it on social media um, or the, the packaging is authentic, but what's inside is not and the person gets harmed and so on and so forth. So, so indeed, at least this, this fear of, of having uh, issues uh, can hold progress in, in some cases. Okay, so uh, mo moving on to the uh, next question uh, from Panos Kostakos. Uh, uh, we like the question here. Uh, what is the role of organized crime domain experts uh, researchers and practitioners within the newly emerging AI and data-driven approach against organized crime? Is new tech, new technology changing the way we should study or research organized crime? Who wants to take that question? I mean, some of some of you have recently made studies. Uh, I think, uh, right? That uh, yeah, uh, I mean, and and I guess you already probably see see the effects. Maybe you can uh, of of the the need to understand technology and it the way it can be used and its implications. I mean, I cannot speak to the AI and data driven approach, but I do think that the way we study research in OC is changing. Um, partly because of technology. So it's changing and it's not changing in a way, I think. I think what needs to change is that we need more theoretical tools of how, how we can make sense of technology and organized crime and what the role is of technology that go beyond merely looking at this, this makes sense. As I, as I said, it cannot just be a rational choice approach. Um, but on the other hand, I also think that a lot of a lot of the times, actually, it's it's the same old story. I'm I'm thinking of um, of drug dealing in, in in crypto markets. There, it's certainly changing. Um, but on the other hand, there's also again people are interested in uh, in economic benefits. However, I think there also the way people organize is changing as a result of technology. For example. Uh, recent studies have found that um, that actually in crypto markets that were founded on this libertarian ideal where everyone could uh, access the markets, everyone could sell whatever they wanted and everyone could buy whatever they wanted. There's now a trust-based system where uh, access to these markets is limited. So in a way it's changing. Um, yeah, that, that is my answer to this. I hope. 
Well, uh, in my case, that I'm coursing the master in Ecole Polytechnique at Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, no, we there's uh, no approach to these themes, for example. Uh, I've been talking with some uh, professors that it will be interesting, no? but as Frederick said, uh, in this case, uh, well, uh, all the themes are uh, more for uh, economic benefit or for going to industry, you know, no taking care about uh, maybe this part. So yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, really interesting in this kind of way. Uh, but in my case, uh, no, there is no approach uh, about these themes. Also, because uh, it's really technical, no, my uh, my master, more than uh, other issues, uh, it's more from the, the, the technical part. Thanks, Jaime. Um, yeah, Mariana, you are at the Uniqri, um, also in the innovation department, if I'm not wrong. Um, are there like many uh, researchers, many of your colleagues uh, who have um, um, knowledge in uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques or blockchain uh yes we do uh we we have a special department for artificial intelligence uh, actually but also uh, when we research uh, about organized crime in general i think uh, big data has allowed us to process this huge quantity of information and make it easy to identify trends, for example, to connect the dots, because uh, it's a tool uh, to understand how uh, criminals are behaving. So I, I can say that at Uniqri, we, we see an advantage of these technologies and we explore um, not only, well, the risk that uh, there is sometimes uh, when using this technology, especially if, if criminals or uh, extremist groups uh, take advantage of this technology. Um, and we try to, to connect those threats with uh, possible solutions, especially for uh, uh, policy making or, or, or for uh, state parties that are involved in this sort of issue. So uh, we do, we do uh, see a difference. Uh, it's still it's still not perfect. We are uh, looking at different tools and how they work and what information you can obtain from them. But I think uh, in the future, it would be just easier to integrate this sort of technology just to obtain data so we can interpret later. Thank you. Mauricio, I know you had some technical issues, but you, you managed to join back. Did you hear the question? Do you want to provide uh, some, some, some thoughts on that? Yes, uh, sorry, Justin. Yes, it, uh, it was about uh, technology and, and, and how to use it to, uh, for crime analytics, right? Uh, role, what is the role of the organized crime domain expert? Is it, does it need to evolve with the emerging AI and data-driven approach? Yes, sure. There are new techniques on, uh, on, on, on crime analytics. Uh, for example, I, I recommend you, uh, for the person that is uh, interested, um, on uh, research more about uh, crime repeat uh, victimization and also uh, research about a uh, social uh, network analysis. Uh, uh, those uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques uh, use these uh, technologies uh, in order to propose uh, uh, different solutions for uh, uh, different crimes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mauricio. So, uh, so I think we have a, here a last uh, question in, in the chat uh, from Caroline in the city, um, oh, Pug Roberts. So the question is, uh, what about pornography platforms that are showing child rape and sex trafficking victim themes by using the clause in NAFTA that excludes platform from liability as long as they themselves do not upload it. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to answer uh, the question, uh, either in the context of NAFTA, NAFTA or maybe more also generally in, in case of uh, different legislation between different countries. 
Um, so, um, anyone wants to take the floor for this question? I mean, if I if I may, real quick, um, th th this has nothing to do with um, pornography platforms, but as you say, um, I think legal frameworks need to be um, adapted at times. So, in in my context, in the in the space law context, we have space law that is pretty um, pretty strict on on space activities, but it's not enough. Um, there's still a lot of leeway. There's still a lot of discussions. And um, there's still a lot of um, resilience in, in developing the framework for, forward. So this is definitely a challenge is um, to what extent do, do international treaties particularly um, allow organized crime to, to, um, to use technologies. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the, certainly one of the reasons that why there's so much illicit trade is because of uh, uneven, uneven legal frameworks. You know, if we had the same laws and the, uh, uh, general agreement on what's was tolerated as a type of trade or business activities and what, what is not acceptable uh, because of the harms that it causes, then it's possible that it would, would have uh, less of these issues. Um, anyone else wants to add something to this question? Um, so if not, I don't think we have other questions from the floor. We, we just have a few more minutes. I would just maybe ask one question myself. Um, so it, it feels like, you know, with technology, everything goes faster and faster and faster. So if we, if the good guys want to be able to leverage technology and like make it an advantage rather than a, a disadvantage compared to the bad guys, we need to get, become quicker and quicker, but we don't necessarily see that, especially when we need complex agreement for cooperation, or sometimes it's very slow to adopt new technologies. Do any of you have, have some some ideas to how to combat that and, and move faster? Uh, uh, well, Frederick, you even talk about anticipating rather than reacting, which is uh, certainly uh, a smart way, but um, anyone wants to add something to, to this uh, question? Uh, well, for me, it's a difficult theme in the part of ethics for companies because, uh, well, a lot of technology is developed there, no? uh, and a uh, lot of people just in their own way in the ethics part. So, uh, as you said, this will be really, really fast, uh, but I think for both sides, not for only bad guys or, or good guys, no? The, the, the theme is the regulation from the governments, but uh, maybe uh, making more, for me, no? More strong the part of, of, of securing all that, all that can, kind of transmission, uh, we can lower that organized crime take the, that kind of information, no? for example, in, in, in IoT, uh, they can't hack you. It won't be possible, no? but it will be more difficult for them to take your information, uh, city information, uh, all kinds of information that IoT uh, devices uh, are sending to the, to the cloud. So uh, for me, it's, it's this, no? it's a lot of part uh, of, of ethics, maybe. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jaime. I don't know if someone can add, wants to add very short words. Otherwise, I think I need to wrap up now. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to say that this yeah, might very be. Quickly. Uh, yeah, this might be actually the answer to um, Panos's question. So this, I think, this is where researchers come in to advise people on how we can how we can keep up and actually appropriate the, this fast pace of technologies and, and consult governments on how to do that. Yeah, and if I can add, I mean, this is pretty much the work that we, the work that we do at Unicri. Uh, we try to analyze this technology, we try to analyze these trends by criminal organizations and we try to anticipate uh, possible risk or attacks. And then we, we connect with other 
uh, organizations, with governments to discuss these threats and to implement solutions before they happen. Obviously, it's uh, you cannot prevent everything. Uh, times are moving fast, technology is moving, you cannot have eyes on everything, but um, certainly that's what we're trying to do and we're trying to um, spread this cooperation with other organizations because I think that's a key element. You have to have governments cooperating with each other, you have to have institutions uh, working together on the same page. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marina. So I think I, I really need to wrap up now. So I would like to thank very much the speakers for their great presentation and the audience for their excellent questions. I do hope that you enjoyed the session as much as I, I did. Um, I think uh, the session really made the case that uh, technology has an increasingly important role um, in the way we address and we understand uh, how to understand organized crime and its evolution. Um, so uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that, but the global initiatives have made a, a report recently on, on new technologies and, and their impact on organized crime, dealing with internet platforms and, and, and uh, uh, social media for, for human trafficking and also for sex uh, 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 pornography. As that's what, one of the questions. So um, if you have other questions, I believe you can find uh, the emails of the, um, to the, the participant. I believe you, the presentation will be made available and you can uh, access their email. Feel free to reach out to them. Thank you very much again to all. And um, uh, I'd like to bring this session to a close. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.